Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Uh, welcome to OATS. Uh, this meeting will be recorded and posted to the OATS website and YouTube channel for the benefit of those who can't attend live today. Um, I'm your host, Nate Palpalm, the training specialist with the OATS, and this series is brought to you by the Organic Agronomy Training Service. And this is our 19th episode. Man, it's been fun. Uh, today, our guest is Casey Bailey out of Fort Benton, Montana. And we are going to have uh, some, some interesting chats. But before we dive in, I want you all to sign up for the Organic Agronomy Listserv, where we're going to have some great conversations right in your inbox. And that's it for housekeeping. So I want to welcome Casey. Thank you for joining us. Um, was hoping to just get started off with a little bit about your background in farming and how you got into the organic space. Sure. All right. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm an hour earlier than you, so my brain cells are going an hour slower. Just to keep that in mind. <laughs> um, uh, getting into the organic space. Um, so I grew up uh, farming with our family. Um, in central Montana, I farm just east of Fort Benton in Shoto County. Uh, really, the progression was we, uh, our farm was fairly forward thinking in that uh, we switched into considering no-till in the 90s um, fairly early uh, to the point where our um, grain drill uh, wouldn't uh, seed through the stubble that was left after the previous uh, harvest. And so my dad tore apart an old swather and he went out and clipped a thousand acres just so he could uh, maintain that no-till status. But, you know, that was sort of the advent of um, of uh, glyphosate coming into our area uh, that we weren't we didn't we thought we didn't need to use tillage anymore the the roundup uh could and chemical would was promoted as the healthiest practice uh so we didn't have to use tillage um i personally uh went away to college after you know farming with my family every summer and um you know just got that old education and it revealed to me that there were uh you know, biological practices that could um, fix atmospheric nitrogen and maybe some of these chemicals um, weren't very healthy for us. My dad had cancer when I was in college. I almost came home and didn't finish uh, my degree, but he uh, made it through that. Um, but, you know, putting a lot of those pieces together and finding the joy of working with uh, healthy soil and that thought really brought me around to organic farming and uh, that was around 2008, and since then I've been um, trying my darndest to figure it out, and it's been a lot of fun. That um, you just said about learning that biology can fix nitrogen, I feel like that is one of the big reasons I wanted to have this conversation with you. Um, the when we think about organic, I think the the biggest selling point that one could just really rest on is the is not using synthetic nitrogen and and making sure our our fertility is cycled um could you tell us a little bit about how you started your crop rotation and what it's become today and any sort of like high level lessons you feel like you've taken away as far as realizing the truth of that that idea that came to you in college yeah um i like to hold the two scenarios up in every conversation when I'm um, getting into the challenges of both a conventional and which be using like a synthetic urea for fertilizer versus organic. The weight, uh, you know, with that urea fertilizer, it can come in on a truck after you pre-bought it and you can easily spread that prill on your field. And that is really your, uh, the role of the farmer in that practice is reading the 
weather so that that urea doesn't volatize into the air or run off into the um, water and all your money just goes down the drain. Um, as far as fixing nitrogen with a plant, it really is a whole nother world. You're you're managing the timing of that particular plant. There's a lot of different species choices. Um, and the biomass that we're after, we're after this organic matter to um, build up into our soil to create a house for all of these um, organisms while we're also wanting to consider that cycling back to next year's crop so we can make some money. Um, while also having to actually deal with that biomass. You know, it's a wonderful thing, but um, I've often found with alfalfa or yellow sweet clover, it can really get away from you and use all your moisture and be a total pain uh, in the moment wrapped around your shanks um, to deal with. So the evolution for me has been a lot of trial and error with all of these crops. Um, I'm going to uh, make a plug for this book uh, the soul of soil. Yes. Um, it, it talks about the different stages of carbon to nitrogen ratios, depending on if it's an annual or if it's a biannual or if it's a perennial. And I am using all three of those crops to, uh, fix nitrogen in our crop rotation. And originally I was using, um, peas for plow down, yellow sweet clover biennial that I'll plant with a spring wheat or a barley the year before. And that um, biennial then grows on into the next season and we'll then manage it then by um, mowing or tillage. And then I'm also using perennial alfalfa. Um, alluding to the fact that I've had a lot of wrecks uh, dealing with those uh, nitrogen fixing legumes is I would like to really put that out there strongly <laughs> that we, um, you know, yellow sweet clover, when we first were managing it, I would go into a major panic because there would be nothing growing. It looked like there's nothing in the field. Mm -hmm. And then spring would come along the heat units and I would turn around and here was this yellow monster growing on my fields. And, you know, when you have five, six, 700 acres of that to manage, it grows faster than I could get to it. Um, as far as getting there with a disc. Um, so what we ended up doing, um, specific to yellow sweet clover was we roll all of our fields and then I have a, a butterfly a triple mower that we can mow really quickly that will mow a 30 foot swath. And so as soon as that, you know, as soon as we think we're, we're early, we're almost late. So we'll start mowing all of that yellow sweet clover down. And then once we do that, it just kind of, it cuts off its water use. And so say if in Montana, we go into a drought season and there's no more moisture, that mowing almost discontinues any growth at all of weeds or yellow sweet clover. And so if we're fortunate enough to get a little moisture and we get some regrowth, we will come through with a, um, a high speed disc. We're not using a real heavy disc anymore. Um, and that mowing operation the biomass of the yellow sweet clover tends to dry down so we can chop through the, the top residue and then kind of get underneath that root ball and give it a good flip. Uh, we'll end up having to come back through with the duck foot. But at that point, uh, we're able to get through it with those shanks. Um, I guess the reason I brought up that book is I um, I go along from the spectrum of, you know, if we plow down peas, it is a very soluble, um, quick release of nitrogen and carbon, and it can dissolve quickly into the soil. I mean, we can get some incredible, um, uh, incredible biomass of of peas, and um, have a nice have a nice tilth and green manure there, but it it goes away quickly. So, I guess uh, uh, thinking about the biennial, the annual, and the and the and the perennial. Um, we're trying to use both depending on field condition, moisture, um, and, 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 and building up that organic matter. Cause the, the perennial 
and the biennial definitely leave um, more of a of an intact root system that's going to stay there into the next year. Say if we do need to use more tillage, um, so I I predominantly am using alfalfa at this point. Um, for a, a slate of reasons, um, but really considering where we live with that, you know, 12 to 14 inches of rainfall, um, and that I'm not going to get a crop this year, I'm going to, um, in 2023, it's really going to be the year of incorporating that green manure. So I really want that uh, residue to stick around for the following year and not you know, volatize, run away, or um, leave our soil exposed to erosion. So, Before uh, we dive into the, the alfalfa side of things, could you uh, just uh, talk a little bit more about this practice of planting the yellow blossom sweet clover with the cereal and how that, that saves you X amount of tillage uh, by not having to go through and do another planting separately? Um, and how you learned that practice and sort of uh, how that is somewhat of a cultural norm in Montana now, but it seems like it's uh, a bang in, um, a bang in nitrogen opportunity. Yeah, it's a solid um, option. Um, it's, it's a fantastic experience to wake up um, early spring when it's muddy and realize that you already have a little plant out there um, ready to rip using that moisture, which would be the yellow sweet clover. Um, and I guess sort of an uh, anecdote to that is um, I'm often, the only month I haven't seeded in Montana is this one, December, and I'm really uh -huh. bound to determined to do it. <laughs> but yeah, we'll have these open months in February and March well, January, February, and March, and I will wish that I had something growing on those fields. So I have been known to go out with an Austrian winter pea or Arvika pea, these forage peas, and try to seed them. And if I have yellow sweet clover or alfalfa um, already planted underneath that barley last spring, um, I don't have to do that. I can stay in the house and enjoy my latte this morning. Um, and uh, it's come more apparent. We just are working with a few professors here in Montana. And any kind of disturbance that we do to our field does impact the um, ecosystem represented by the enzyme actions that are happening. Um, even the no-till fields that um, are not getting those disturbances. So the... the, the um, the, the most minimal um, trips over the field that a biennial or an annual offers us is is becoming more and more important. Um, and I think I'd like to add to that, you know, people really the success of getting the stand of that green manure is so important. Um, getting an alfalfa or yellow sweet clover. Um, germinated and up in a solid stand with is 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 so critical and so i think it's really important to which far all farmers do just sort of you're you're having to you're having to understand an annual crop that you're considering for cash for yourself while also considering the importance of getting a much smaller seed established underneath that, that it's going to benefit your next year and then your following year's crop. And then ultimately, you know, deep into the future of your rotation. And so um, thinking about that 10 day forecast, that um, long-term forecast, what your soil has to offer, what type of soil it is that can support um, those smaller seeds at that particular planting time, especially if you're doing those two crops together is, is really important. And, you know, if it's not right, it might be worth not planting that biennial this year, just going for your cash crop. Um, but if it is correct, it's important to go for it. And it's almost like you need to have all those seeds in the shed ready to rip on a trailer so that you mm -hmm. can make that decision in the spring. Um, another thing is considering if you can diversify your market so that you have 
a, an, the ability to sell that annual crop as as hay. So for instance, if mm. if I, I go out and have barley and I've got yellow sweet clover under it, and I am thinking about this particular field and I'm like, man, I, I think I need to focus on the soil building part more than taking that annual to a cash crop. Um, there was a time that I seeded the biennial and an annual or the perennial by itself and then under barley across the rest of the field and a third of that field I took out um, as a hay crop so then uh, probably be June 15th to July 1st um, that biennial that alfalfa or yellow sweet clover then had full rain of the sun and the moisture for that growing season mm -hmm. um and then, then over on the the other part of the field it, we took it to cash that barley to cash crop um and then on the other third it was just straight uh green manure and where we didn't have a cash crop it actually did the best the next year but it was a weedy mess where we took it to grain that grain really did suppress the um the yellow sweet clover or alfalfa and then where we hate it 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 helped it a lot so um we got a bigger bang for our green manure buck that following year uh by through that haying process and still made some money and got rid of some weeds so kind of a long answer there but I, that was really no no that's great um when you plant the yellow blossom sweet clover with the cereal are you then just rolling it right after you plant the cereal and then you'll have that's 18 months or so um, before you're doing another tillage uh, action after you're grinding up or how, how long after you mow down the clover are you then coming in with the disc? I see what you're asking. Um, it really depends on uh, moisture. Um, mm -hmm. If we're going to get some rain, if there's rain still left in the soil, um, if there's moisture, we will come in like the next day. Okay. Just let that biomass dry down if there's no moisture um we'll wait wait for a rainstorm mm -hmm. okay um so you grow spring wheat winter wheat barley some yellow blossom sweet clover and then how about on the pulse side what all is it in your rotation there uh for cash crops we're growing chickpeas and lentils um yellow peas okay and then alfalfa of and course. so how so in Montana, it is not, I would argue it's not super common to have a lot of dry land alfalfa. Um, right. how did you decide to plant that first crop of alfalfa? How, how did you get the good seed stand? Um, and then how have you sort of made the decision to grow that as a percentage of your acre? And what percentage of your acres does it represent now as part of your rotation? I think the Oh, visiting with some of the grain millers here, they said that it's they're always happy to get grain that was raised off of um, alfalfa rotations for the protein. And so they're actually able to use a winter wheat um, versus a spring wheat for uh, milling. So uh, winter wheat kind of starts to act like a spring wheat in some cases. Um and then just from sort of the old timers who've been farming forever, they always refer to, well, that's green over there and looking good because that had alfalfa in its history. Um, and, you know, I, I took out some CRP uh, conservation reserve program when I first started farming and wherever we had more alfalfa in that stand, the, uh, the grain just did incredibly well. Um, so, went for it that first year and you know i think i think getting alfalfa um seeded and germinated is there's a lot of luck involved so make sure your luck is high when you go and do it but really what it came down to for me and what i i try to do is is have a really nice firm seed bed um for that alfalfa but or seed it before rain. It doesn't really matter. Just don't go too deep with alfalfa um, and you can get a good stand. Um, I think I have about 1,500 acres in. Uh, maybe it represents about 10 or 
of our farm. Um, I'm going to probably expand that number into, you know, the 20% range. Um, the reason I'm doing it, uh, it seems like per acre cost to get the alfalfa seeded is the most economical for me to get that real long-term benefit of um, the nitrogen in the soil. And I don't have to continue to come back uh, worrying about not having enough fertility. Um, after we have alfalfa in four or five years, the condition of that um, soil is just, it's rich with nitrogen um, possibilities. And if I then come back with a fall seeded wheat crop or something with a lot of potential biomass, it seems like I am with moisture able to get um, just really get a lot of organic matter going and that that perennial yeah. can support a future of um, of uh, of a rotation that's going to um, add organic matter if if the if it rains so. you started your organic side i believe pulling out crp or transitioning with crp um Transition is a hot topic right now with this 300 million going to organic transition and a lot of folks trying to figure out how to help farmers transition. A lot of farmers having questions. How do you think about transition, giving your experience on all, all ends of the spectrum, uh, moving ground into organic status? How do you use biennials, perennials, cover crops? What do you think of as like the best, safest strategy to get it through those three years? So CRP is going to be in a lot of different um, positions. Some will have you no know, no legumes. Some will have just grass. But I think it is in a state of health, um, just because it has been sitting there in a no-till situation. Um, you know, under the sun, photosynthesizing, feeding these lovely lives and creating uh, creating um creating what we want on the earth's crust for food production <laughs> um however it's not a home run to just go till the heck out of it and have um a success sustainably into the future what i found if the i think regardless i i really think trying to get in there minim and do minimal disturbance and seed peas, seed an annual, a nitrogen fixing annual right off the bat, trying to maintain a nice, you know, flat area um, and be gentle with that, with that land as you, you know, bring it into an annual production. Um, but I think activating it with an annual legume is maybe one of the most important things to do. And then see what it has to offer, because I've I have witnessed um, horrible Canada thistle infestations in old CRP stands, and um, so I don't know. It's it's hard to comment too much um, without knowing exactly, you know, field by field and how it looks. But from my experience, I have gone in with a P versus non a P, not peas and. Um, to try to get some nitrogen and biology active activity happening, mm -hmm. and then going into um, a cropping system to see what it's like. And then I will pop back over into an alfalfa or a biennial clover fairly quickly um, just to mitigate some of those weed problems um, and resist the temptation of over tillage to try to chase that perennial Canada thistle or bindweed issue. For uh, those of us who have just joined, um, my guest today is Casey Bailey. He's a farmer outside of Fort Bent, Montana, in central part of Montana, and um, locally referred to as the Alfalfa King because of his <laughs> leg game. Um, and folks, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. Um, happy to happy to ideate. A lot of farmers who are in the grain business, um, I've heard describe the idea of getting alfalfa as just one more action, too much more equipment, just too different. How did you make the jump into the hay business 
Um, and how did you see it as a complement to your efforts making you a better grain farmer? So um, I came from a 120 foot sprayer boomed John Deere chemical distributor that would go 19 miles an hour. And I had in the back of my mind, can I make our organic farm as fast and efficient as the chemical side? Uh, sprayers and no-till has really revolutionized the amount of time that it takes to get over ground. So it was actually going to a Moses festival or a conference in Wisconsin. We drove by a few equipment dealerships with these triple mowers because I was fighting trying to get over the ground fast enough to get that alfalfa just down um, and came across those uh, triple mowers. So I spent a lot of money on hay equipment through the years um, trying to achieve ease and a fun experience for, you know, we probably have four or five or six people that I'll bring in that friends and family, I wanted a comfortable, fun experience for us to get over 12, 1500 acres of hay, which it wasn't <laughs> for a few years, even like 50 acres was just, I mean, it was a community building process because we were using all these small squares. So I went from stealing at night neighbor's equipment to get the job done because I didn't have any money and Brit begging friends to come out and pick these little small squares. And then like, okay, now what do we do with these things to, uh, honestly very efficient um now we can get over the acreage it it does take us three or four weeks probably but in certain chapters but the experience is um i wouldn't say pleasurable but it's doable uh mm -hmm. and i guess on the economic side i would just take you know what what it would take to grow a crop of winter wheat here to get you know a 60 bushel crop the nitrogen input, um, I would just subtract that right off the top and say, okay, am I losing money or am I making money? And every year we have made more money on alfalfa than on conventional winter wheat um, mm -hmm. by factoring in the cost after I got the equipment paid for. Um, and so the, our equipment's now getting to be 10 10 years old and we're we're running two rakes and have to run two tractors to pull those two rakes and our main seeding tractor we run a square baler with and uh, then we pull one of those other tractors off a rake and run a round baler sometimes we'll bring in a couple more balers if it's a heavy um, and then we're mowing at you know 10 or 12 miles an hour and 30 foot swaths um, so it it's it's all it really is like adding a whole new enterprise and then finding a market so mm -hmm. that when that hay is in a stack because you got to stack it you got to load it on a truck yep. somebody's got to sell it so if it, it, you're then working with the the supply chain um, which you have to create and if you can get truckers who like to haul hay and load themselves man it's a home run and then if somebody actually gives you money for the hay God, it's wonderful. <laughs> so yeah, I just you're, the heck out of you're not in dairy country. How did you find that market? Yeah, it was a grow it and they will come type of situation. And I've just found that uh, hay tends to go away. Um, and through the years, I've, I've had a lot of fun um, shaking a lot of hands and talking to a lot of people. But as years go, it's kind of nice to just have a couple markets. So it's really efficient. And, and that's just sort of happened over the years. But most of our hay goes into beef herds in the area. Um, we do have a strong group of organic farmers. And so it's a certified organic hay. And if they need some, I have overwhelmed the market for them. So they're, <laughs> they, I, I do sell to a lot of organic farmers. So that's been good too. Um, in this idea, I really wanted to just kind of expand on your point about what is making money on the farm. And I think that it, in our, in our heads, it's really easy to think about the check you get for wheat because it's just a little bit more linear that you combine, you take it to the elevator, you get paid versus a little bit more of a delay with the hay side of things. But when you're thinking about the role that a crop does, besides just calculating the saved synthetic nitrogen, how else do you sort of give credit to those maybe non-cash crops 
as you're thinking about your entire business enterprise and say over the course of your rotation, uh, the value that it's producing? Yeah, this might sound um, like a backwards comment because hay does take alfalfa does take a lot of time. But the nice thing about it is I have, you know, 12 or 1500 acres sitting out there that if I broke my leg, if I went down the road, I mean, even if that alfalfa went to bloom and it wasn't managed timely, it is doing a service for the environment. Um, I've, you know, through the years I've, um, we haven't been efficient and uh, we've gotten a lot of rain and that alfalfa is sort of let go and we didn't get, we didn't manage that field. Uh, but when I came back to it, to to work with i mean you couldn't you couldn't dream of having a better um biomass of organic matter even even having the that cheat grass the weed come underneath um and you think oh this is a total disaster it turned into the most beautiful tilth of soil building um going into the next year so for me it, it is time management and i only had to make that decision once and get that seed established that once. And um, now I have a no-till situation that is is positive for, um, you know, reducing wind erosion and um, uh, collecting that snow in the winter. Um, and then, you know, we can even graze those fields. And our alfalfa fields, it's funny, they're the first ones that everybody wants to go drive on or park their equipment on because it's a stable situation. Uh, that perennial creates a healthy platform. And so I have to tell people, no, this is not, this is not a runway. This is my field. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that that's been a, that's been a huge benefit. So I really think that if, you know, even if you don't have the hay equipment and you only have time to consider 30 or 40 acres, don't stress about it. You know, even if, even if it's something you can't manage well, it will manage itself well, and it will contribute to a future. Uh, when, when we plant our, our grain crops, uh, you are handing the tools to that grain crop through soil building that will end up providing more time in, um, in concern over weed issues. Um, the one thing with alfalfa and yellow sweet clover is managing moisture and understanding where your moisture is because it will use a lot. So there's a recharge um, period after growing that in rotation that's really important. Um, and if I... And, and part of that too is that doesn't mean we shouldn't plant a crop. I think we should uh, you know, take that, that wheat in the bin, get it clean and get it out there. Even if it's not a very good crop, it will, it will be a living root in that system. And this past year, we had a drought the year before. So I seeded spring wheat right back into a winter wheat field that had been alfalfa the year before. And we finally got the moisture. And I mean, it, it didn't matter that it was a wheat on wheat, that spring wheat was ready to rip, um, the alfalfa had mineralized and and uh, re started returning um, nitrogen and or you know a soluble plant available organic matter to this year's spring wheat crop, and so we had an absolute bumper crop this year with some winter wheat. I I no tilled right into that. Well, that's a lie. I w I made one pass um, with this new outfit we've got. And had a little bit of winter wheat that survived. So I had a spring wheat, winter wheat mix that was made 60, which is just incredible. So yeah. mark that down on your on your notepad. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, your do you buy any fertility or bring any fertility in um other than the legumes and the, the seed that you're using? Um, I have I have messed around with a little bit of um pelletized rock phosphate and um a little bit of composted chicken manure but i have not been convinced it's going to be a common practice um mm -hmm. i'm still i'm really the only thing i watch is our phosphorus levels and our we have phosphorus there it so my the question in my mind is 
you know, is that fertility there at germination, right? When that seed is germinating, do I need to add something? But so far, it's still a question mark in my mind. I'll, I'm going to keep playing with it, I think. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the workhorse is going to be the legumes providing most of your nitrogen for your cash yeah. crops. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, weeds. So transition, I think of as really a weed and fertility and disease mitigation question. That if you're coming to go off this system where you had a lot of tools and you're going into a system where it's much more systems based, um, what role does that, you've mentioned alfalfa as sort of a, a weed mitigation. How do you think of haying, alfalfa, biannuals, um, as a weed control tool. So I think there's and some what weeds. And which 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 one of those little devils? Uh, I think there's something to be said for there's going to be weeds. <laughs> You're going to have to deal with weeds for face value. But I also think weeds are a symptom of the lack of a biological nitrogen, which I am definitely not an authority on that, but observing our fields that uh, that we're in uh, a chemical synthetic urea bath through the years, there are certain weeds that, you know, that have become resistant to chemicals. And I think that I have noticed those become softer when we use a biological nitrogen like peas and alfalfa that it will change. So I think in transition, it's just really important, even before you say, hey, I'm transitioning to organic, I think you should start pulling back on synthetic fertilizer inputs and using uh, biological inputs, even if you're going to keep spraying, say, I'm not sure what's going to happen. This could be a total wreck. Maybe I should plant peas for my nitrogen, plant my wheat, maybe consider not going organic yet, just to learn for yourself. Maybe that year you should spray the weeds out as you are building up your um, nitrogen, biological nitrogen fertilizer. Um, at least give that grace period to yourself. Because um, I think once you get into it, it'll start to make sense, but you don't want to create a wreck right off the bat. Um, mm -hmm. And that's another thing with the alfalfa is that you know, like if you if you're transitioning, <clears throat> which I've done using barley, alfalfa, or a sweet clover, um, you take mow that barley off or take it for a cash crop. The next year you can uh, roll the ground and all those weeds that you may be surprised are there or aren't there will come on. And then you have the opportunity um before any of them go to seed to mow them down. It might be good hay, it might not. Uh, you can make that decision then. But the following year, you'll have a very nice clean field to work with. Um, whereas even using yellow sweet clover, I have used that for transitioning. And in some cases, it works well. In other cases, mm -hmm. for us, uh, wild oat comes on like crazy. It loves tillage. Whereas in our no-till ground, there it wasn't there. And then also um, Canada thistle uh, is is there for us, for sure. And where I've used uh, yellow sweet clover, I've had an incredible first crop. And then after that first crop, after plowing down the yellow sweet clover, I, I planted spelt. I had just a forest of spelt. And then the Canada thistle just came on like gangbusters. So I tried to push it through without alfalfa for too long. I had a wreck. So I went back into alfalfa after that. So with Canadian thistle and bindweed, do you feel like those are, with the, the incorporation of your alfalfa, overall manageable in your rotation? Or do you feel like there's still, we, we, we haven't quite got it in organic? How's your, how's your feeling about the state of the state of the weeds? It depends on who you are, I think, as a farm. Some farms can't put their whole place in alfalfa for five years. Depending, you know, your can the thistle and bindweed might be a horrible wreck. Um, but if you can, I we can handle both of those. 
with um with a perennial um not necessarily a perennial with grass included off the bat i think you need a straight stand of alfalfa for four or five years and i the canna thistle i seem to manage pretty darn well and then i can go into four or five years of crop rotation but um bindweed is going to be there i think it's just going to live in the field but if you can incorporate mm -hmm. a perennial in for like a seven year rotation where three or four years of it's an alfalfa um you and you you have to get a good stand though and manage it well yeah. um and also go into that alfalfa stand having a clean field too you know thinking in the back of your head well that bindweed and canda thistle it's there but i did a heck of a mm -hmm. job preparing for this particular stand uh, that i've got of alfalfa so there's a lot riding on the shoulders of the farmer in this scenario uh, but it is definitely manageable so you've we um a couple of calls ago we had kathy zabinski on and mm -hmm. And, um, and it was a great conversation, um, but you're working with her on the farmer side. And, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the questions that you have about soil health as it relates to this greater pursuit, like you said at the beginning of, can we take what we've sort of perfected on the conventional side and make it organic? Can we harness biology um, in a way that makes it so that we're building more organic matter, we're having a a fairly fun time farming that is not a horrible drudge um and uh and so when, when first first i'll ask what are the questions that you're most interested in as far as what you've learned in farming and where you want to go uh so what we were doing with uh kathy um i guess we have some pretty major themes happening in the farming a community and one is uh well well really two and we're trying to figure out how they're related uh carbon and microbiology um and asking what do i do as a farmer to make both of these better under the new uh you know uh, under the new observation that um, microbiology is around us. You know, we're all sitting here at our computers, but we are literally a cloud of microbiology and the soils are full of microbiology. And it just so happens that they give us health. They allow us to live and we allow them to live. Um, so it's just a very fascinating, wonderful thing to consider. Um, and so we have that on the table um and then carbon uh we've got we want that carbon in the atmosphere to be happily in our soils and on the earth's crust for um uh, much greater reasons than even producing a good yield this next year just for the maybe the salvation of humankind <laughs> um and in so doing if we can have a higher organic matter level in our soils it keeps more moisture it makes all of these organisms happy um it cycles the nutrients that are important for the plant and it's a sustainable thing that will make our farms healthy into the future and so you know those are the questions we're asking and um mm -hmm. i think one thing that really came up with kathy's recent um, data that she just got was how the you know she's looking at the enzyme reactions and 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 making like is there a lot happening in the soil and what is that why is that happening in this particular field and over one farm with like 15 different crops and like a 15 year rotation she found that the activity doesn't necessarily follow the crop but it follows the field and that particular field the reason there was so much activity was because directly attributed to the organic matter that was already there and so also from some of these tests um on my farm 
I had some bare spots where the pH was very low. It was very acidic. And then I didn't get a stand of alfalfa in these. Right next door, I had a great stand of alfalfa and it's happened for like three years. So something different's happening between those spots. Not only didn't I get a stand, um, but the relationship between where I did get a stand and these bare areas supporting like wild oats and different things. Um, I wanted to know what was happening. Like what did that alfalfa do um, where it was growing and how has that relationship grown? And so what we found was that the biomass of the microbiology really wasn't that different. So I think my big takeaway right now, and we should have another Zoom in a year after we get more data, is that uh, right. getting as much organic matter into your fields as possible is our number one, number one um, objective. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe ask me more specifically after I just, my, my, right. my brain's losing it a little bit. <laughs> totally good. So um, there's been, a, there, I'll, I'll sort of jump to, there was another study that was talking about the duration of, of nitrogen and the effects of alfalfa yeah. in crop stands. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. When we think, you, you've said that several times, Alfalfa isn't just a moment uh, where you're getting some hay off. It's this really long-term effect on the soil. And could you speak a little bit to those results as well? Yeah, and these results, I'm just um, a big fan of Clay Jones and Kathy Zabinski, Perry Miller at Montana State University. They had some long-term studies where they were looking at one around Bozeman and also in Saskatchewan. It was like a greenhouse um, gas study. And I think not to get too far in the weeds, um, but they started from different points. And one point of their crop rotation they analyzed had basically a straight stand of alfalfa on a conservation reserve program. And from this study with these long-term rotations, it's 11 years later, they had a big yield and they're able to analyze where that yield is coming from. And what they determined was even 11 years later, the nitrogen that supported the yield in 2023 came from that perennial alfalfa 11 years ago. And they, they personally could not believe that. Um, and so I think that is another piece that we should be considering when we're planting these rotations. It's not really a, a year in year out situation. If you can get a perennial involved, um, you will be benefiting for, you know, a decade plus. And so if you're also rotating in biennials and annuals into that situation to mitigate other, other issues, um, considering the carbon to nitrogen ratio on what's available in time next year or the year after with the amount of rainfall, you will be accessing different levels of availability of nitrogen throughout that. So once you start into a rotation, it's not like you end it. You're just building upon that um, if you're incorporating perennials. So I'm whoever takes over the farm after I'm done, man, they're going to be set because it's going to be a, a rich history of perennials. So well, what an I what an interesting way to sort of think about this this movement of of carbon building, carbon markets, and where we're giving credit to what. Mm -hmm. Um, well, when you're thinking about your you know your drive to build soil organic matter, um, we definitely have the perennials as a major contributor. What on the annual side do you feel carries the most? weight does the most work as as far as that carbon side and getting it into the ground um grasses really do but mm -hmm. i i think our fall seeded uh annual wheat um if you can get a good stand just and then the species you know the variety dependent i suppose uh um, if I wish we had greater markets for some of the older grains like spelt, triticale, um, ammer, they have an incredible amount of biomass, but, uh, so, so do some of the varieties of our modern wheats. Um, 
and we're having to really keep an eye on where we are with disease and some of those older grains might be more susceptible to the diseases that are just existent now. Um, right. I'm, I'm getting good amounts of organic matter on top of the ground, but some of those, you know, Rampart is one in Montana that is a solid stem. Um, I think it could is an important winter wheat that should be focused on, but I, I am considering bringing grasses, a, a perennial grass though, onto our farm and seeing if I could enter that into the rotation, considering that alfalfa has this, you know, legacy of, of deep tap roots that are going to be there. If I can then get a perennial involved in some cases, I think, I think maybe there'll be some more soil building and soil health there from a perennial grass um, after which I which I can't quite picture yet, but it may be important to do that. And I wish you know a Kernza from the Land Institute. Maybe maybe it will get developed to a point where we can um, have a good market for it and uh, easier uh, grain to work with. I think that would be a really important to addition. Given the since you brought it up, given the challenges of, of Kernza yield. Um, it seems like we're, you know, a lot of the efforts that are going into this idea of perennial wheat um, are, are a math question in my head. So if we have, you know, five years of no alfalfa, or rather no tillage with our alfalfa, um, and then we get several years of really good yield annual wheats, mm -hmm. overall, are we not somewhat farther ahead? by just sticking with alfalfa for cows and then wheat for humans as far as yield, but as far as the goals of soil health, since Kernza will only last a few years, even at its best with a low yield. Um, do you think we're like the the zeitgeist is thinking about perennial wheats and the goal of perennials right? Or do we have really good tools that we should just be exploding right now rather than trying to reinvent things? Yeah, if we have a math equation in this moment of time, we should be going gangbusters on what we know. And we know a lot about how to work with uh, perennial legume, annual cropping to get us real close to the same soil health that I'm observing with a Kernza that I do not have a market for. However, I think we should all be in the conversation, maybe, you know, Intermediate wheatgrass is what Kernza is, and it's an incredible uh, species that makes great hay. Um, so mm -hmm. maybe I've got enough deep nitrogen in some of my soils, and it is it would benefit, say, just a you know fifty acres uh, in the scheme of things. It would benefit from putting that perennial um, wheatgrass in. It doesn't even have to be Kernza, but then we are ready. Say if Kernza does come down the pike, um, we would understand how to work with a uh, perennial grass also that does incredible things. Uh, you know, we, as far as soil health, undisturbed ground will always win. Um, the, the comparison that we, that Kathy has with my, you know, native ground or highly productive native ground versus my annual and even versus the Kernza field, that untouched, uncultivated ground has way more organic matter, more enzyme action. And so I really think that there's a place to really get good at incorporating perennials somehow, an uncultivated um, piece to our farms all the time. Even if it's like, I'm going to take 2% of my farm and I'm going to put it into a grass alfalfa perennial over here. And in my career, I'm going to keep looking at it and I'm going to keep measuring it. And maybe it will benefit, you know, the next generation of people that are trying to figure out how to farm sustainably. Going into the future with organics, what do you think are some of our our biggest challenges that we have yet to solve as we think about organic growing in the market and more folks maybe who have a little bit less of a um a a nerd streak as you and I do 
uh, yeah. who are really just trying to make it, make a living uh, with a different set of farming. What sort of challenges do you think we need to be thinking about solving, or at least asking about, um, as we try to encourage more than 1% of the land to go organic? It might be a human culture thing as much as anything. Uh, allowing allowing friendship across uh, industry, um, which means also allowing friendship across the um, extending into conservation. Uh, and as far as our particular communities, I found a, a central thread in that when I talk about the feeling I had of going organic or trying something different on our farm as being like the most revolutionary risk-taking warrior thing I've ever done. Like I knew I was going to just completely bankrupt our farm and embarrass, you know, the family legacy. Um, it was that feeling that we have in farming communities that taking risks and letting your farm not only be the place where you make money, but also where you can experiment and ask questions about life, um, where you will have some failures and being able to have neighbors see those failures and and be excited about them because they know you're shooting for a success story. And now that, and maybe that would encourage your neighbor across the fence to try some stuff. And then you can both laugh at each other's failures and think, well, let's try this next year. Um, I think that that building that type of a culture, I mean, nothing can stop us if we can all work together like that, rather than like, you screwed up, I'm going to take your land <laughs> type of a situation. <laughs> um, so we encourage small farms, more people farming, more experiments, and more talking across those cultural barriers. More people's ideas on the land coming from the land is what I'm hearing. Yeah. So yeah. We need a, more eyes and, and minds going after this. Well, Casey, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I really appreciate it. And um, we will post this recording to the Oats YouTube page. Um, but hope your uh, your winter is going well, and I hope this might have inspired some folks to try a little alfalfa on their farms, or at least extend that uh, that range of crops that they're interested in growing. So thank you again, and uh, and have thank a you. fabulous holiday, everybody. Take care. Thanks, everybody.